Welcome back to the Hoops Temple Podcast. Y'all know me, Nathan Schwartz. Joining me from Sacramento, Aaron Schroeder. Good afternoon, guys. And join us from the nation's capital, the basketball capital of the world, Jack, a.k.a. Jokic Joestar. <laughs> the basketball capital of the world employing Kyle Kuzma as like the second option. I love that. Hell yeah, absolutely. Second option? Kuzma for president? Come on. Hey, I'll be I'll be a big I love Kyle Kuzma and I think the pairing is gonna be fun to watch win like 20 games or whatever, but pool, I wanna pool shoot as much as you want, bro. Knock yourself out. Go right ahead. Well, we uh yeah, we did in Washington last week and uh the trio, our collective average was uh twenty four wins. So you know. I feel like that could be high, to be honest. Like they they really might just like commit to the bit from the start. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we'll see how many how many minutes Koulibaly gets, and that'll be our, our gauge of how much uh, <laughs> how if much they, they let really him care about in. this season. Yeah, if they let if they let Koulibaly be an MVP, how we know he can be, uh totally there, but like that would definitely upset some of the locker room dynamics. And so are they willing to do that right away? That's the question. I uh, I'm all in on Kulabali. Like I feel like he has such potential, but I also can't imagine like a Wizards lottery pick panning out. Like when I close my eyes and imagine like tenth overall MVP Kulabali to the Wizards, I black out and wake up in the forest a month later. It's just like something you can't really process. But I, I digress. Simultaneously, I think it would be extremely on brand for the Wizards to only hit on the 10th pick, which is like the most mid reward for a horrible (laughs) season. If you like tank and you get the 10th pick, you're like, this was a waste of a year. But I don't know, maybe Koulibaly hits. He rocks. I think he's going to be real closer to Jan Vesely, but I'll I'll, we'll stop on the Wizards talk. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, that's Southeast. We're here to discuss the Northwest, the like polar opposites of the conference here. Uh, the way we've been doing these, Jack, is we've just been starting with the worst team most most commonly is, you know, working our way up from the uh, worst, the best in the division. Uh, and so I think we'll throw it to you. We'll let you uh, nominate. Who do you think is going to be the worst team in this division? Um, no hate to Ice Bryce Sensible, but I think the Jazz are probably, I, I have the Jazz worse. Uh, I, I don't know if that's like tough between Utah and Portland. Uh, I actually like, um, I like Jeremy Grant. I like Scoot. I like Simons. I like Aiton. I think they'll both stink by the end of the year, but I think the Jazz will be bad the whole time. And Portland could have a Utah-esque start to the season next year where the, everyone's just like, they're supposed to be awful and they're 500 right now or something like that. Um, but yeah, I have Utah at the bottom, kind of a hot, okay. hot take, I guess. How are you guys feeling on it? That's so interesting. We, we we're talking right before we started recording about how I, I tend to judge these teams in a vacuum. Like, and, and I, I get too into it and I'm like, I actually kind of like these pieces and I forget that they actually have to play like another NBA team. There's not like mystery Euroleague teams that come and play them occasionally. Like they have to play the Clippers and the Mavs and the Nuggets a bunch of times and other like Western conference teams. Um, I had them at the bottom. Like I, I, I'm not in, I think one of the biggest things is rookie point guards aren't great. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. without that kind of facilitation, it's going to be tough. Like they're going to have to go through all of the growing pains of Scoot Henderson as awesome as I think we all think he's going to be. Um, they're going to have to experience it and you're not going to win much. Um, I had him as a pretty bad 18 win 15 seed. Damn. Well, I mean, I guess we'll see. This is why I'm digging my heels into the ground. <laughs> the Jeremy, good. the Jeremy Grant all-star campaign is really popping off. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's just <laughs> like, uh, when I look at them and when I look at Utah more specifically, I guess, uh, I see a team that pretty clearly needs, to get worse before they get better. And so I think like they, I, the way I've looked at Utah's season is they're coming into it with like a commitment to getting a high draft pick next season. Uh, and Portland, it would rock for them to get another top five pick or whatever. But I feel like as far as the future goes, they are a lot more comfortable with the backcourt pairing of Simons and uh, Scoot Henderson to go along with like, 
a variety of other young-ish talents. I don't think they have like their roster for the future locked in or anything like that, but I don't think they're as like, I don't know. It's a little bit more muddy for Portland, and I think that that might lead to them winning more games than Utah, like 25 versus 21 or something like that. Again, I think they're both going to stink, but I pro- I, I, I feel like Utah is going to be lower. They're much more similar than I think either of us are – we've really been kind of considered because they both have the potential of having a defensive back line with their bigs. I mean, Kessler Walker could keep if Utah in a respectable place on defense, Robert Williams could keep Portland in a respectable place on defense. Um, And then Aaron, when you were getting on about a rookie point guard, I thought you were jumping off of Jack's comments about Utah. And I was like, well, yeah, I guess Keontae George could be handed the keys like right off the bat. Um, they've been kind of hesitant to start Colin Sexton. They like him in that reserve role. If they do give the the car over to Keontae, that's um, you're, you're going to have all of those same growing pains in Utah that you're going to have in Portland. Um, so I guess I was thinking of Utah as better because of what Laurie Markin had shown. I do like John Collins. Um, Kelly Olynyk is like a stable presence. But he could also be great trade fodder. They could start moving off some of these guys. I, mean, I could go either way. Yeah, that that's a fair. I think fair it's statement. uh when I when I look at Utah and specifically the phrase trade fodder, uh, like put this into my mind is just the sense that they almost miraculously pivoted from a very mid roster with two like high quality players in Gobert and Mitchell, but they have spent like the last half decade, seven years, however long that pairing was like kind of committed to in Utah. They've spent that like knowing what it's like being a good team that doesn't really have a hope of getting over the hump. And so Mm -hmm. I feel like that gives them unique perspective in terms of like really committing to a rebuild as a small market that lets them get into as good as position as possible to like fill the roster with very talented players a la Oklahoma city or whatever. And I don't think that incentivizes keeping players like, uh, damn, he looks just like me. Oh, Olenek. That's who we were talking about. I don't think that incentivizes keeping Olenek on the roster because he is a stable presence and a winning team would like him on the team. And I feel Mm -hmm. like, if you can like get a little bit of assets back for him, that's way more beneficial in the long term. If you're Utah, okay, see, okay, see, he's got to you know try to make that play. He looks really nice with Shea. They have that Team Canada connection. Like, you got some young prospects. You got a buttload of picks. Like, and you want a big guy. Sense. Like, you want you want a big, thick mm-hmm. guy next to Holmgren. You can't just like put that out there as your front court without a little bit of girth to you, not to get yeah. too, too descriptive <laughs> on the pod. No, the girth is always very important. Um, the jazz are going to bring in three first round rookies and Taylor Hendricks, ice Bryce, and Keontae George. Um, I also like that when we say Walker Kessler, it just anything comes out like, like some combination of his name, Kessler Edwards, oh. Kessler Walker, like who fucking knows what's coming as soon as we get like it's, it's I will almost flip that name forever. <laughs> um, I do actually have three trivia questions for these guys for these two teams. Okay. And I have okay. um one preview trivia question for the entire division because I just as I was putting together, um, I do like a spreadsheet of, you know, kind of depth charts, trying to look at all of these teams as I'm going, I started to notice something. So our overall Northwest division preview question is last year in the NBA, there were 10 players with hyphenated names. <laughs> oh. This year, <laughs> six of them are currently in the Northwest division. How many can you two name? Are we going back and forth? Like, uh, yeah, like the we'll go back okay. and forth. Uh, Aaron, you can go first. Actually, no, Jack, you're the guest. You can go first. Damn. Name a guy, then yeah. Aaron names a guy. Me. First one to get them wrong uh, <laughs> loses. That's tough. <laughs> That's brutal. Horton Tucker off the top is who I have for Utah, but I, I need to, yeah. That's tricky. Okay, All right. Horton Tucker. That's a good pick. I'm going to stay in Utah. Is Juan Toscano Anderson still on the Gens? How do you lose this on the second? Person? He was he was on the Jazz. <laughs> He's in Mexico. Oh, jeez, this is terrible. Oh, that's brutal. that's a great guess. I thought he was on the Jazz last year. No, uh, 
Yeah. Keep it going, yeah, Jack. Keep... What else you got? Yeah. What else you got? Dude, I don't, we I don't even try know. To fig- we can try to figure this out. It wasn't to Scott or Anderson. Um, Horton oh, Tucker. Cald- Caldwell Pope. Uh, is he yep. hyphenated? Okay. okay. He's, he's hyphenated. He's KCP. Yeah. Um, Do any of the teams have no players with hyphenated so I can just like eliminate rosters from my mind? Uh, Portland does not have anyone. Okay. okay. I feel like the Thunder have to have some sort of like. The Thunder have two, one fucking... of which is an all star. Oh, SGA. Okay, SGA. <laughs> we'll start there. <laughs> <laughs> the G is not his middle where, name. Where is his, uh, where is the hyphen? It's, it's it's between the, the two Alexander. last names. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Wait, is. um. Oh, is Anthony his, Pounce. Is his... is... Yep. Is his cousin uh, in this division? Is SJ's his cousin? cousin is in the division? <laughs> oh my <laughs> god! Nikhil Alexander Walker, yeah. Alexander Walker, and Walker Alexander, whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> Walker, Walker Kessler, Kessler actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the other one, which I don't think you guys will get this one, um, unless you're just real deep draft sickos and uh, way too invested in OKC. Uh, Jeremiah Robinson Earl. Okay. Yeah. Never, never would have gotten that. I'm Thanks so bummed that Juan Toscano Anderson is a is a wrong answer. He, I should have gotten like half. Not in the league. That's bullshit. so. Of the other ten guys, nine are still in the league. The other three are Kenneth Bates, Diop, Michael <laughs> Carter Williams, and Dorian Finney Smith. Damn, Michael Carter Williams. That's a deep cut. Mm-hmm. How old is he? Right. Do you know? Like, do you have it there? By thirty. I don't. My guess is thirty. He can't be that uh, old, but I mean, yeah, it's just like weird. Let's see here. Uh, he very well might be thirty. He uh, he is thirty-two this year. Wow. Oh shit! All right, yeah, no, he's old. And, Who is yeah. that that player that? Uh, it was um, Mason Plumley is thirty-four or like thirty-five or something like that. Ooh. Yeah. Imagine Man, an that NBA with me. no Plumleys in it. That's gonna be crazy. I know. They gotta have kids soon, like right? You know oh, that's how, how true, far? I guess. Are they they're more? Aren't they? Are they? Was it a Mormon family? <laughs> that would make they, so like, much did they, sense. Did they all go to BYU? No, they all went to like Duke or they all had like blue okay. bloods. Oh, uh, okay. all right. Okay. All right, Aaron, I'll give you a chance to redeem yourself here. Okay. This game um, we're gonna go with the Portland question here because I think okay. this says a lot about Portland. Last year, in the final 11 games of the season, Baden Sharp played in 10 of them. During those 10 games, he averaged 23.7 points, 6.1 rebounds, 4.1 assists. What was the Blazers' record during that final 10 games? Oh, and 10. We'll give you a chance to answer, and then Jack and <laughs> the, the and closest. They were 0 and 10. <laughs> they lost every game. I was very mad about this at the end of the season. It's fucking blatant tanking. <laughs> <laughs> um i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna go two and eight but i don't feel as confident yeah it was zero and ten <laughs> they were two and eight in those oh, games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he Floundering knows the ball there, everybody yeah. damn uh, wait and take wins there was two, Come and, on. two and eight's fine <laughs> two and eight's fine they rested him against san antonio so they could lose the game against the spurs mm-hmm. trying to you know really tank it, it up matter i was gonna mention end, i guess I was going to mention about Rob Williams. He is the perfect young player for a tanking team. He's going to be sore and aching every day. He's going to be day to day the entire season. He might play 15 games. Like I, if I set the line, like 25 games played this season, I'd go under. Yeah. It's crazy with, uh, Williams, how in Boston just doesn't fucking matter. Uh, if you play 40 games or whatever, cause like he's their sixth best player mm-hmm. or any rocks as a defensive anchor and like getting him healthy for the playoffs is sick. Cause they're always like really good at blocking shots or whatever, but him in Portland. Yeah. It's going to be a lot more obvious to people. They're like, Holy fuck, this guy, can we get like 10 Never straight plays. games out of you, pal? <laughs> Where is everyone's uh Deandre Aiden stock at? I had, um, I think a lot of people see him as a positive asset, like, oh, and Aiden's going to rebound or turn it around or something. He needs a new environment. Um, I don't think that's true. I, I don't think he's, he's very good. He's, um, you say everyone, like, I haven't been just beating that drum, and you're like, all right, we're going to set uh, set Jack up to take Nate down. I, I see what you're doing here. <laughs> I, see, I see what's going on. No, it's like I'm on I'm on TikTok, man. I see what people are posting. Um, I see uh, 
it's a lot of you know he, I, I get it Aiden in a new situation maybe it was a phoenix issue or something but um i made a video earlier today about how james wiseman sucks because he's like kind of good at posting up but that's not really important or valuable if you can't facilitate from that spot so it's like negative basketball and, and aiden has like the same issue like he can give you quality post up possessions kind of but it's like awesome if it was 2012 that's great. He's like, he was fucking awesome. Like, you know, keep posting up, guys. Um, it's just not yeah. very good basketball. I mean, to think about Aiton, and he would be a revolutionary 2012 prospect. Because oh, then sure. you get like a, li a little bit of the face up game that he has. People would lose their fucking minds over. <laughs> like, oh, oh my, my God. God. He'd be Seven like, he'd be like guard. supercharged young Blake Griffin. Like, if you go back and watch those old, like, uh, the young Blake Griffin Clippers games, like, they're just running Blake post ups every possession. <laughs> like Aiden would Aiden would feast, man. Yeah. I mean, I think I guess I'm somewhere in between, uh, in the sense that I think I really agreed with your point on TikTok forever ago that it was like 18 and 10 is not what it used to be in terms of like contribution statistically. It sounds Thank really you. good, but yeah, 18 points per game, whatever. Um simultaneously, I do recognize that even if somebody's not that good being in that situation in Phoenix could not have helped him in terms of uh, things like defensive engagement or just like the motor problems that we routinely saw him showcase. I think he will be like the most empty 21 and 11 in the league or whatever. He'll be like new Nikola Vucevic. Uh, but um, I also so mean, dude i got I, it's weird i will i will always send a stray his way i just uh when they moved him for wendell carter jr i was like that's not a good move and then the franz wagner pick happened because of it and i was like fucking obviously classic chicago but they're not in the northwest so um yeah i don't know i think chris paul is probably the best player he could have played with to maximize the stuff he does in like the short role and it's going to be a long time before scoot henderson is even really good at facilitating that kind of offense. But uh, I think he'll be better than he was, but I don't think he's that good. That's such a great point. Such a great point with the Chris Paul thing. Chris Paul helped DeAndre Jordan make an all-NBA first team. All-NBA first team, DeAndre Jordan, and Aiden's like struggling um, to... They're to very different get... players, though. Yeah, like... but just stand in the fucking basket. He's like 7'1". <laughs> he's so athletic. Like, you tell me, like... It's come on. I, I had um in the same video about Wiseman, I mentioned in a comment that Wiseman's he is a bust, but he's somewhere between Anthony Bennett and a Mecca Okafor. Now I actually think that's where Aiden <laughs> is is a Mecca Okafor. It's like oh my generations, God. this generation's Okafor because Okafor has like he played like ten yeah. years and he was it, he played all eighty two games like three straight seasons and he's ten and ten or fifteen and ten or something and it's like okay. Yeah, I will say as a lob threat and with the DeAndre Jordan point, uh, Aiden should be a fucking nightmare for like opposing rim protection in terms of like lob threats for Chris Paul. And like that is also when you uh, Chris Paul has taken a step back in terms of like the little floater that used to be automatic with the Clippers and like mid range scoring and making the big really press up on him in the pick and roll for, to open up that lob threat. But I also don't feel Aiton should have like a career highlight reel of bodies that his lob catching is really routinely just like open dunks. I just don't feel like he jumps much. Like I don't I don't <laughs> feel like he puts the effort. Like when you're talking about DeAndre Jordan, it's like, oh yeah, Jordan, Jordan ran, Jordan jumped, and like Aiton's like, I want to catch the ball at the high post and then like jab step and shoot a it's the footer. worst kind of center you could ever want like it's that's a center nightmare you want your center to rebound and play hard or be like this offensive genius not like that's the worst that is it's, that's the come on that's that's the last center you want on your team you know how Dude. like a lot of guards went to go to like hakeem's camp and like i'm gonna add a post game i'm gonna work with hakeem this is like he went to carmel anthony camp of like how do i be an inefficient mid-range like spot up shooter <laughs> just like i don't know you painted such a brilliant image in my mind the second you said catch the ball in the high post like the entire play you described played out in my mind before the i was like oh yeah i've seen him happen where he just mm -hmm. catches it 
okay, okay, maybe like one dribble towards the basket. And I mean, it goes in at a good rate for again, 2012 sure. uh, would have been efficient offense back then. It's just unsustainable now, like as savvy, especially if you're giving it up at the rim on the other end, which he, I will not defend him as a rim protector. Hell of a fantasy pick if you can get him late next season, I feel like, but I don't, yeah, I'm not huge on him in terms of like contributions to winning basketball. If is this, this is moment, 20, go ahead. Is Nate. this the moment where we reveal the TikToker fantasy basketball league? Um, I mean, maybe a little bit of a debut. <laughs> yeah. Has anybody else, uh, has this been brought up yet? I don't think so. B- I don't know. Big things, big things are coming, listeners. You guys are getting exclusive access. Everyone tuning into Hoop Temple right now. And, and by big things, we mean a 20 person deep fantasy league that uh, is going to make us claw our eyes out looking at the waiver wire. <laughs> I love him. I'm Killian Hayes is going to be a mid, like tenth round draft yeah. pick with how many He's... guys we've got going into this. Uh, me and Nate are already in like a of my close circle of friends and family. Like it's a fourteen team league, and th- there's no one left. <laughs> like there's no one left on way. Like like Denny Oddview is a really big deal. Like when he came off waivers, like oh shit, like he might actually oh, play. Oh my god, yeah, <laughs> dude, that's Someone's crazy. John Wall. Like, yeah, I texted him. I don't know. He doesn't know basketball very well. And I was like, I know ESPN says John Wall's on the Rockets. He's not on the league. He's not in the league anymore. <laughs> ESPN needs to fix their fantasy. Yeah, they're so slow. With, like Carmelo Anthony is still like a player you can pick up. Like um, I could probably trick most of the people in our league to like trade for Nikola Jovic. Like it's, it's a good group. <laughs> Damn, that rocks. That's super fun. Um, the other, t- the other league I'm in, uh, it's eight teams. And so it just like, it's, it's like the other end of the spectrum, how it feels like every pick carries a lot of weight just because like, if you don't make like a good sixth rounder, you're leaving 35 points on the board or mm-hmm. something like that. But uh, I am very excited. It's weird how I'm curious if anyone's going with Miles Bridges in the 20 person uh, chat, just because like uh, that that would be good fantasy points. But like you're a scumbag if you pick him up. And so he'll just be like sitting there the entire season. I have faith. Everyone's a good person. We won't do it. But it's easy to say up. that until you you're looking fucking game, Jack. <laughs> not here to lose. So you can't. <laughs> not here to make you, friends. What are you talking yeah. about? The man got rearrested again. Like, who's oh shit! Yeah, That's I forgot true. about. Yeah. He's, yeah, he just threw uh, pool balls through his girlfriend's uh, car window with the kid in the back seat. The man's not playing. We don't have to worry yeah, about this. That's true. Pool balls? Where the yeah, fuck did but... he get? Have you ever tried to carry more than two pool balls at once? <laughs> <laughs> He's got his shirt like a little pouch <laughs> in kindergarten. Just a good hoodie yeah. pocket. Like... That's so funny. Seriously, He's like pool Perfect. balls in his pockets or something. Like, especially oh. to walk outside with them. You didn't cool off in that little <laughs> march to the car. Yeah, it's the so, the Kanye bridges. West driving sixty miles to, uh, not Kanye West. Fucking Matt it's in the Kanye song, Matt Barnes. Driving that far to beat up Derek Fisher. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, what the damn. fuck were you listening to on the way over there to keep that like to keep that uh that mental keep fortitude the anger like, going? Seriously. Okay. I just All want right, to recap. We're... I had the Blazers at 18 wins. Maybe I'm being mean, but I don't like some of their players. They were average. They were they were a bad team with Damian Lillard and a worse team without him. Um, I had the Jazz as the 14th seed, right above them at 26 wins. Maybe I'll do. I'll take two wins from Utah, give them to Portland, and we'll we'll be happy. Yeah, I mean respect. I it's not going to be consequential, regardless. I will state that the the Blazers are probably gonna fucking stink the way that Utah does. But I just feel in my stomach that Utah, good shit's not happening out there, man. Give up the Jazz name, you know. Do you uh do you have a wins projection for either of these teams? Um, I don't written down. I will say, let's go Portland. Let's go Portland 23 and Utah 20. Man. Solid. I actually did All my right. math wrong. I had, um, the jazz at 22 and the blazers at 20. So pretty equally awful. This is going to be the worst jazz basketball since pistol Pete. I mean, they're, they've always been really good. They've been good since basically after Pete is is almost directly into the Carbalone era and that into Darren Williams and all that. And they haven't weirdly good. Since. Yeah. yeah. 
So my jazz trivia question is, uh, is last season the Jazz got off to a surprising hot start. They actually maintained the number one seed for a section of the early season. I remember that. Uh, they Up to what date did they hold the one seed? What is the latest date that Utah was in the one seed? Um, wow. I'm going to say, damn. Was it like the same uh, starting point? Was it like October 24th-ish when the season tipped off yeah. last year? Okay. Yep. I'm going to go uh, maybe like December 5th. Okay. Aaron? I think it was earlier than that. I'm going to say um, November 15th. It was November 21st. Damn. Okay. Splitting the difference. Now, from that point, uh, Utah would fall off and eventually drop down to the 10 seed. How? What is the first date in which Utah was the 10th seed? Wow. So um, November 21st, they start losing. And it's not like... It's not like they were like wavering on that point. Once they started to lose, it pretty much just continued. I'm gonna say they were the tenth seed by December twenty seventh. I think it was later than that. I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go February. I think it's like February. Honestly, like they, it was oh, pretty late in the season. I'm gonna go February second. Uh, so while Utah does bounce back up uh, a little bit, they get in this weird tie where like 10 through six are all tied. Um, they first hit the 10 seed on November 28th, just seven days Whoa, after being the was... one seed. Oh, I wow, forgot okay, about that. Yeah, yeah. Like the whole bottom half of the West was tied for, that was crazy. And I bet it'll happen again this year, to be honest. I yeah. forgot that it. I guess within the the standings are so like, there's only a couple games to go around. You fall pretty quick, but they, they yeah. yeah they come back. When did they? Uh, I guess I wonder what that 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 progression looks like, like the graph of like one C, ten seed, and like five six six down to ten or something. Yeah, just just a cliff. Uh, but I, I I was looking at that. I was like, that's you know some fortitude because they like they could have tanked super hard and been like, cool, we had this early, you know wins and now we're just gonna lean in and tanking and they didn't quite do that so i ended up going with 29 wins wins for utah i just i feel like they have enough good things here that while i am skeptical um that a point guard rotation of colin sexton keontae george and chris dunn is gonna be good it's chris dunn in the league Chris well, dunn yeah, in the yeah. league. he's with there utah. was a dunn renaissance last year he <laughs> averaged like 12 points and shot like 50 percent from three for 15 games it's done. Okay. No. Yeah. Twenty-two games. Yeah. I like. I just can't bring myself to watch the 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 tankathons, and it's like when Portland was on their slide and Utah was on their slide. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not participating in this. <laughs> I'm not throwing this shit on. It doesn't matter. Like, yeah. yeah. Not, I don't know. I can't. The tankathons are fun in the preseason. That's when they have. That's the real season mm. for the tanking teams. But How old from is there. Now? 29? 29. He's old. He's old. Me and Nate last year did a podcast called like, are they done? Which was like <laughs> players younger than you'd expect that be out of the league. And we said Chris Dunn, but he's, he's survived. I want to go. I should go back to that and see who you're right about. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a fun revisit. Damn. That sounds like an interesting topic. All right. Well, James from Weisman that. soon. James Wiseman in like two years. <laughs> Marvin Bagley at age 26. He's done. <laughs> okay, 26. Go ahead, Nate. Go ahead. I was going to ask who we're talking about next. Uh, who is going to be the middle team in this conference? Let me take a look at the actual division. Sorry, right. they keep saying conference. Division, Minnesota, Oklahoma, or, well, it's not going to be Denver. I think Denver is going. 42 and 40, baby. Um, <laughs> now, I think, I don't know. I think these two are very similar. Like the way I set it up was tier one Denver, tier two uh, Wolves versus Oklahoma City. Uh, very much in the thick of the playoff hunt. Probably not like securing home court advantage, I don't think, but also towards the top of the play in, lower playoff seeds, stuff like that. So I guess I'm going to say. Damn. 
this feels like I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'll probably go Timberwolves middle of the pack. Interesting. I um I had them one game apart from each other, so it's not like that crazy. Um, I had the T Wolves as a forty seven win five seed, and the Thunder as a forty six win seven seed. Um, we can start in Minnesota if we like to do that. Yeah, let's start yeah. there. In which our trivia question for Minnesota is: Last season, Anthony Edwards has averaged six point eight pick and rolls per game. Comes out to being about four hundred pick and rolls on the season, or over 400 and he averaged just zero or he averaged 0.9 points per possession out of the 31 players uh who ran 400 plus pick and rolls last season where does anthony edwards rank in points per possession uh and for this one i think who went first last it was jack so aaron you get to set the line and jack you to go over or under okay so sorry, how many how many players ran 400 or more pick and rolls? 31. 31. I'm gonna say that Anthony Edwards and his partner in crime Rudy Gobert, who whoever <laughs> the fuck it was. <laughs> um I'm gonna say 20 28th. Mm, I'm gonna set the line differently, 26th. Okay. i go I'm comfortable going below 26. 28 was gonna be a little bit more tricky. The answer is over, just barely. It was 24th. Oh, mm. damn. All right. That's better than I anticipated. Yeah. That's still yeah. pretty bad, though, for a, a player of his caliber. Uh, yeah, if you want to know uh, the best, I wrote those down. Uh, we've got Curry with 1.14, uh, Mitchell and Lillard both 1.13, and then the absolute worst are a uh, couple of Pistons. We got uh, Jalen Ivey he with... Uh, 0.78 and then Killian Hayes 0.73. So uh Damn. Yeah. yeah. Motor City basketball, baby. It's gritty. <laughs> it's hard nosed. You love it. <laughs> Always has been. I feel like um God. We're trying to those... bring back the defense of the 80s by just not being good at all. <laughs> not scoring. <laughs> God, those Dame Giannis pick and rolls are gonna be insanity. Like the nightmarish. Duo. Yeah, nightmarish. You could just run those at half court. Just have but does Giannis dive to the basket from from the top of the yeah. circle? Well, um, I was gonna say, um, it's so funny, like that question. Just um, that I'm not sure there's a bigger disparity between like uh the value of somebody's pick and roll and the value of having them just drive to the fucking basket than it is with mm-hmm. Anthony Edwards. And Anthony Edwards pick and roll is an ugly possession, and like yeah. you could literally just be like Rudy go try to get the rebound. We don't even care if the rim protector's there because Ant's going to fucking dunk on him or finish around him with his long-ass arms or something like that. So, yeah. It's nice that they have Mike Conley, though. I think uh, maybe that um, they should just focus on him running pick and rolls. It helps resurrect some of the Gobert value because the the Gobert, Edwards, yeah, it's just like the worst pick and roll in the league. And Gobert is like a decent pick and roll big. It's why he set the you know record for screen assist or led the league in screen assist. I don't know how many years in a row, but yeah, the two just do not stat. mesh well. It's a ridiculous stat that no one else does. <laughs> you know no what? one else I... has ever gotten a screen assist. He's the only person <laughs> in the history. I want of the that NBA. stat to be like retrofitted into the 90s. I want to see Dale Davis like lead the league in it and everyone freak out about how great Reggie Miller's teammates are. <laughs> Go back. <laughs> There's the thinking basketball piece on Dale Davis's screens. Um, with the Timberwolves, so last year they were 42 and 40, not a great season. Cat played like 30 something games, or correctly. Um, they were the 10th best defense still. They had size, they had Rudy Gobert, like that's still good. The 23rd best offense. I think with Cat, that kind of fixes your offense problems. Um, so I had them, uh, had them pretty, pretty solidly. Forty-seven win team. Um, they lost Trey and Prince and Austin Rivers. They added Shake Bilton and Troy Brown Jr. That is one step forward and one step back. There's nothing <laughs> going on there. Um, but it has everything to do with Cat coming back and how he how he fits in with a uh, with the team. Yeah, I think. Uh... Three big things are Cat returns, uh, Anthony Edwards, the age. He's going to get like exponentially better every year if he is improving. Um, just because that's like what happens when you're 22 years old and like you're really just operating off like an insane level of raw talent. And then I also think uh, 
McDaniels, whether it's Jaden or Jalen, I don't remember which one's in Minnesota, but he's a damn good defender, damn good three and D guy. I think uh, if him and Ant both take step forwards as defenders, which I think is really possible because of the physical tools that Ant has showcased, having those two be very, very good on the perimeter to go along with Gobert still, which I mean, for all the screen assist bullshit, he has the worst hands in the league in the pick and roll. I don't care. He can still protect the rim really well. I think their defense uh, could theoretically improve from last season just because McDaniels is yeah. otherworldly on the wing and Ant's like a hard second best perimeter defender to target. Mm-hmm. Alexander Walker's also pretty good at defense. It's like he showed some valuable minutes. Um, yeah, they they can offer a lot of different lineups. Like you could go Nas, McDaniels, Walker and Edwards, and that is like a young, fast, up tempo, very switchable defense. Or you could go big with Gobert and Towns, and like Denver is is the top of the West. They have a really good lineup to go up against Denver. Like some of these other teams, I one of my big knocks on Phoenix is they are fucked if they play Denver and they like can't guard point. Like Minnesota has a little bit of something for everyone. It's not the best, but. I like the versatility where I actually think maybe we overrated what a regular season team they could be the last year. Uh, I, I know we were talking like, hey, they, could they do 50 wins? Maybe not, but they actually have a lot of versatility for the playoffs. So I'm going with 46. So that way they're behind teams like uh, the Lakers and the Warriors, first, but over teams like Sacramento and the Pelicans. What's with the I, shot feel I feel What's comfortable. I feel comfortable with forty six. Like, uh, yeah, I think um, no shot. it's. I don't know. I laughed when you said uh, they could run out the Gobert and Cat lineup because my brain immediately just goes Nas Reed small forward. But uh, <laughs> I think yeah, they do have a lot of versatility. And Reed, the Reed resigning was really good. He's really good. They will at least have people to like go and take fouls on Jokic or whatever, which is a lot more than you can say for Bull Bull or whoever they're cooking up in Phoenix Mm -hmm. at like backup center. But uh, yeah, I think 46 is solid for the Wolves. Cat is underrated. Um, People act like he fucking stinks. I'm not going to like sit here and sing his praises all day, but he is like a big difference, especially when you're trying to space the floor with Rudy Gobert. And so I think if you can get like 60 games out of Cat and a healthy playoff appearance, uh, that would do a lot for them. The on-off numbers a... of Cat and Gobert weren't great when they were together, if you look at the whole season. But if you look at the second half of the year, once um, Cat returns from injury, and you have Mike Conley in the mix, like they go from average, like I forget what they were like, plus 0.1 or something to like actually a pretty solid good lineup of that, you know, Conley unlocks it and they kind of figured each other out more as the season went on. I, um, I wanted to mention on the Anthony Edwards piece, his driving ability, Jack mentioned earlier is just insane. Um, he, he will do moves where you're like, Oh my God, like he should do that every time. Like, let's, let's do that again. Like just jump from the free throw line and just destroy people. Um, I think an underrated part of driving and what makes drivers so good is um the lack of care for your own body. <laughs> like when Dwayne Wade and John Morant like attack the basket, they like attack it. Like, I don't care what happens to me. Like if I die on this drive, it'd be a, a life well lived. Um, and Edwards just, like, I feel like he has the ability to, to attack downhill, like fucking LeBron dude. Like he has that ability, but I I'm still working on this, uh, on this analogy or on this term, but the wolves are kind of like, like a bedazzled coffin in a way where like they're very much dead like they're kind of expensive and the roster sucks but they may be pretty good this year like there's no future here they have no assets like that isn't going anywhere um they have the the, the one of the worst contracts in the league um but like for, 47 wins is pretty solid oh yeah I, that thought actually already occurred to me, but I didn't have the term bedazzled casket to throw out there mm-hmm. or coffin or whatever. But yeah, um, we have all like the vibes around the Timberwolves are holy shit. The Rudy Gobert trade is the worst trade in NBA history. It has completely decimated the future of a franchise that has found itself in possession of one of the best young talents in the league. And it's just like completely fucked up what that guy's career is going to look like if he wants to stay in Minnesota. 
but they would be like, yeah, they could win almost 50 games this year. It just sucks that that's like one of the better outcomes. Like that's mm-hmm. the higher ceiling of their regular regular season ability. It feels like on the bright side, Minnesota is used to trying to build around a guy without draft picks. On the downside, they didn't were unsuccessful. Work. That did not work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's true, man. Shout out Joe Smith trying to get uh, money <laughs> under the table. Oh, I don't know if it was him or the Timberwolves or it was both of them like trying to get money. Why? Of all the players, why, why do you tamper him? with the guy that plays the yeah. same position? <laughs> like, why could yeah. it have been like, oh, the Timberwolves tried to sign like Kobe Bryant with under the table money or something and right? carry him with KG? It's like, no, like we lost four first rounders because of Joe Smith. I think they were trying to go for someone that was like somewhat believable. Like if Kobe's, <laughs> like, if Kobe's like, cool, I'm moving from LA to Minnesota. They're like, all right, what's the tampering here? Yeah, Come on. Seriously. How much under the table? It's like, no, I really, I really just like it here. It's like, bullshit. <laughs> Shut up. You're lying. Oh my God. Yeah. We got uh, any trivia? What, what are we doing? Um, we got OKC. Okay, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and this is me revealing my uh, my wins early. I am predicting a 50-win season for the Oklahoma City Thunder. Last year, Oklahoma was 40 and 42, so they were sub-500. Since the year 2000, how many franchises have gone from sub-500 to 50 wins? And I will say, I was wow. lazy with this. I did not do 50-win equivalent uh, equivalents. So, like, if <laughs> that shortened season, you won, like, 47 and it would have been 50. I, I'm i sorry. I didn't actually do the math. Not a 50-win team. Doesn't yep, count. Get them out of here. Up. Wow. Uh, who set the line on the last one? I set the line. All right. Okay. Jack, you can set the line on this. There's 30 how teams. Many teams? Okay. teams. How many of them uh, since the year 2000? I also was not going to go back and do this. So this is how many times this has happened? No, how many unique teams have done this? For okay, instance, so yeah, uh, Phoenix did it twice. Okay. Once with okay. the Booker Nets uh, getting good, and once with Steve Nash. Okay, so uh, it's at least he, two times. Okay. Yes, <laughs> at least two times this has happened. But yeah. but it's it, that's only one franchise. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna say I want to set it at like six franchises. I think are we? I think we're off on. Is that right or? Oh, he's setting the line. You got to go. Okay, over. he said the yeah. line. Gotcha. Do you think Six more franchises, franchises or yeah. less? Because I know the Suns and the Celtics did it. The Suns and the Celtics and um, the Nets did that. Um, did the Kings win fifty this year? Kings only got forty-seven. No, damn. Um, the Baby Thunder did that. I'm like ninety percent sure. Um, I'm gonna go over. Over is correct. Since 2016 franchises have posted a sub-500 season and then an over-500 season. And I went through and checked these to see, like, what was the cause? Um, Because, like, all right, Cleveland did it the year they brought back LeBron. (laughs) Sub-500, over-500. Miami did it the year they... Or, uh, actually, Miami did not do it. They were uh, not sub... But, um... But, like, the Lakers did it the year they traded for Davis. Mm. But a lot of these were internal development. Dallas went from sub-500 with Dirk and Nash just playing a couple of years. Chris Paul well, in New Orleans. Pau Gasol in Memphis. Um, Booker in Phoenix. Rudy Gobert and Gordon Hayward in Utah. Like, not large roster moves. Dwight in uh, Orlando. So, like, I, I think the, the Thunder are ready for this. Ready for that takeoff to go from 40 to uh 50 plus damn i'm not like super against that uh by any means it's just um i don't know like when i think about maybe it's just like the phrase 50 win team kind of jumping out Mm -hmm. at me but it feels like 50 wins in the west is going to be a lot next season like it'll pretty handily secure you maybe like a top four seed um and so 
I would probably put the Thunder closer to 47, 48. Uh, I think they will be better than the Wolves by a game or two. I don't think it's going to be a big gap. I'm concerned about Chet staying healthy. I think Chet, if he plays a lot, will Mm -hmm. uh, fill a lot of what they need in terms of like rim protection and stuff like that. He'll be super fun to watch. Uh, The bullet I had written down was that the Wolves and the Thunder are similar in the sense of like two elite talents. The Wolves feel like they're contingent on the progression of Anthony Edwards. The Thunder feel like they're contingent on the progression of everyone around Shea Gilgis Alexander to me. Yeah, that's a fair like split to look at this because we know Shea is good. We are questioning can Giddy, can Jalen, can Shet and you know take the leap i just I think, think they're can. too young i know it's tough because it's like oh that's fucking ridiculous but i have them at 47 wins compared to 50 wins it's basically the same but um i feel like you do need veteran players you just do, do. and the thunder yeah. just you yeah no you do davis Berton, the season davis Berton <laughs> slander he's a locker room presence <laughs> <laughs> they brought um, in a Euroleague guy that's like 29 and was an MVP. Yeah. Like thinking of all those young teams that did that. I mean, like I mentioned the Nets and they got Jason Kidd and it's like, that's a nice fix. Um, getting LeBron always helps. Getting Anthony Davis is a cool way of doing that. Um, I want to look back on those jazz teams with Gobert and Hayward to see what else they added. Cause like the 08 magic grabbed like Richard Lewis. They had he to Like these are like, 28 26 like mm-hmm. year olds ish um i think I, they're I kind t- of go for talent what the is primary there. was they're like yes yeah. there are other moves around it but like the philadelphia with, uh... goes from 28 to 52 wins um and in Embiid's second year and it's just like yeah. you had this behemoth yeah um, like the warriors with steph had like ikidala and andrew bogut was was like these are really good players um mm-hmm. I think they're missing that centerpiece, and if that center, like I'm trying to think of a, a that who's who's this? The Thunder is Andrew Boga. I don't Mom even Jay? know. I would be curious who is Jay. like who's the oldest person on the Thunder's roster, even Kendrick Williams, Pokushevsky. Oh my God, Pokushevsky! Well, there you go. Oh, That's your answer, Victor Oladipo. <laughs> That's not That's Oladipo. That's, yeah, but we gotta find some uh, some veteran size, I fear. But those are my my issues. Kendrick, I mean, I'm I'm do down do with size? those issues. A vet, veteran size, that's good, <laughs> Nate. Kendrick Williams is not good. <laughs> uh, first, they first you want a veteran. I give you a depot. Then you want veteran size, and I give you yeah. a, a Kendrick Williams. Now you want good veteran size. Like, come on, it's impossible to find. Yeah. What, you want them to give up five picks to get Rudy Gobert? You know what's crazy? Right. Is they just have so many assets. They have so many assets. Like They could just come over the top and grab like the next three unhappy superstars and build the greatest team we've ever seen. Like If the, if the, if the other teams allow that, um, go get Paul George again. Like Fuck, he's always, he's always itching to come back to OKC and grab someone else, and all of a sudden it's like a 68-win team fueled yeah, by just... picks in SGA. <laughs> just offer double the next amount of teams' picks for, yeah. for Joel Embiid. Yeah, no one else have that has Take this uh, has that kind of assets. I had I had talked with um, the first podcast I did with Montaigne. I I asked him if he trade Chet Holmgren in four first for Embiid. Would you guys do that? Um, like four, uh, whatever like, first, like, like two for one of your the own Thunder. And... If I'm the Thunder. I sure guess anybody. Well, like, Have... see, the thing is, if I don't think it, uh, if I don't think it like makes me overwhelmingly good, I hesitate to do it because I don't. I'm not confident Embiid is ever going to get to the point where he seriously maintains what he does offensively in the regular season into the playoffs, even if he is like 100 percent healthy. I think defensively, if Embiid can make you like overwhelming defensively i think he's one of the best rim protectors on the planet and i think that that could absolutely push a team over the edge into like winning a championship but if like the move makes me look at Embiid and be like hey i still need 34 
and 13 a night in the playoffs or whatever, and you can't get hurt. I need you healthy for six straight weeks. That is a difficult ask. Um, I don't know. But you you say probably if it's just Chet and first. I mean, Chet, there's no guarantee he ever becomes anything close to what Embiid currently is, even hobbled in the postseason. What's four first to Oklahoma City? Fuck it, eight first. 12 Absolutely first. Just nothing. Give, yeah, yeah it's not, <laughs> go ahead, Nate. So I, I that I was trying to check that. Um, do you know how many picks they have? Twenty seven. I'm I feel fairly confident in that. Yeah, I think it's like I was gonna say twenty eight. Thirty five. Holy fuck! How many firsts? You kind of uh, have to. You kind of have to consolidate that, that at some point, though. Like unless they have like a secret second roster they plan on have like housing <laughs> like a minor league team they they just stuff their their g league team is undefeated they win every game by 100 points because it's all nba players um 16 firsts um geez. which i should say uh one of those first is houston top four protected this year uh one of them is utah top four or top 10 protected so utah is probably going to try to tank Make more. That, uh, that's that's a strong point for your guys' uh, just absolute miserable uh, potential. Yeah, it's um, it's it's a lot of firsts. They have Philly <laughs> first, which uh, if if you're trying to trade and beat, you probably want your own first back because that's going to be a, a valuable first. Um, some Miami first. Some got a lot of Clippers first. Those have got to be just rising in value. It is very funny uh, that the Rockets got good enough to be the eighth overall pick and their pick is top four protected. Like, I think the Rockets are going to suck. Um, and But, like, they're not going to be good enough to get that pick back unless they, like, seriously commit to the bit there. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that could be, yeah, I don't know. A lot, OKC has done a good job uh, amassing picks of teams that are probably just going to be, like, bad without being the worst in the league when those picks roll around besides maybe the clippers the clippers might genuinely really stink whenever paul george and Kawhi explode whenever all the time (laughs) usually on february january then then the good russell westbrook the good basketball player is gonna step in Uh, i know aaron we love russell westbrook (laughs) on this page of course of course we do. <laughs> Man, if Houston's pick doesn't convey this year, then uh, Houston gives up next year's second round pick. That's 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 some pretty strong incentive to keep it. It's not like just it rolls over and then it's top four protected next year or next year. Like it becomes a second. That uh, that feels like a huge win if Houston could keep this. Mm-hmm. How would they well, keep just it let Dylan Brooks shoot the ball, you know, and yeah, that's how you keep it. Out. Looking at my my predictions, I had Rockets at thirty one wins. That'd be the third worst team. Be the one, two, three. Oh, be the sorry, s- never one, two, three. Be the sixth worst team. Never mind. Uh, okay, so he still has swap rights for Houston's twenty twenty five pick. <laughs> yeah, okay. They own that shit too. God, they got them dead. That's the rights, that's baby. the Westbrook trade, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe I don't even know at this point. Who knows? Who it's... knows what they've done? Yeah. Okay. I don't we know that I make team. the. Sorry, I just I don't know that I make the Chet trade. Um, because I like Chet as a prospect and as an asset, but I would give up the mother load of picks for Embiid. Yeah. Maybe that's the thing. You'd give up ten first rounders before <laughs> yeah. you before you touch Chet because then yeah, yeah, the second round pick and a crazy prospect is is worth. How many picks would it take to get Chet Holmgren? And that take that and add the, th- the three other picks onto it, and it's like it's eight picks or something, eight first rounders. That's the new asking price. Mm-hmm. The price of a fucking brick just went up. That's what we're doing. <laughs> uh, but yes, we have one more team here, uh, and that's the Denver Nuggets. Now Denver lost two key role players in the off season. Bruce Brown and Jeff Green. They are returning several key role players. Christian Braun, DeAndre Jordan, Reggie Jackson, Zeke Naji, uh Vladko Chanchar. Chanchar? Vladko Chanchar. He's a Chanchar. hooper. He dunks from the free throw line in game. 
and Peyton Watson. Uh, there's a chance you guys can both get this one right because I couldn't figure out a way to make this more competitive. <laughs> Which group played more minutes? The two that they lost or the six players I just named that returned in the regular season? Oh, the two that they lost. Yeah, specifically for lost. Denver. Yeah, it's the, 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 the six that they, they added or, or that they gained. That they, that was good. Reggie guys Jackson did not yeah. see the floor, man. DeAndre no. Jordan, or is it, he's a locker room guy. Yeah, I'm Maybe that's like 150 total minutes between <laughs> Reggie Jackson and DeAndre Jordan. I said there was a chance you guys could both get points here. Actually, unfortunately, neither of you got points. Uh, Bruce Brown and Jeff Green combined to play 3,371 minutes. The other six, 3,968 minutes. Tough. Much closer than I thought that was going to be. Uh, scrambling yeah, I mean, for question. I, I guess Christian Brown uh, is a, a rotation player, so that makes sense. He's probably got a big, big chunk there. Yeah, him, uh, Zeke Naji, and Kanchar. Uh, pretty close to the 3,000. The other three guys, no. Peyton Watson, no. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I like Peyton Watson, but yeah, that hasn't really. Maybe, maybe this is the year he gets worked into the rotation with losing Green and Bruce Brown. Which, I mean, I losing Bruce Brown sucks. Uh, just in terms of like making the team very fun to watch. It rocks when you have a guy who's too good to be going against bench players, going against bench players every night. Like it's super fun. Uh, it electrifies the arena. The team gets super hyped. And yeah, he was a big part of why they won the title. At the same time, I do think uh, it's really funny how everyone's like, holy fuck, they don't have Jeff Green anymore. These guys are borderline out of contention. What the hell? Like, who's going to run hey. those minutes for them? Uncle like, Jeff was throwing down dunks, man. That guy still gets up there. He will be till the end. The heat death of the universe uh, is going to happen, and then Jeff Green's going to dunk on the last atom with energy. <laughs> I wrote. Re I remember that video. I remember that. <laughs> that, that, that was <laughs> that was a great one. Um, just looking at what the the Nuggets lost. It's Bruce Brown, Thomas Bryant, Jeff Green, Ish Smith, and Jack White. I thought about not saying his name. I'll, I'll give him the respect he deserves. Um, <laughs> those guys are, you know, Bruce but losing the Bruce Brown piece hurts but honestly i feel like bruce brown is more a result of the nuggets system and the in Jokic's ability than he is as an individual player and you can probably find someone to do kind of similar things um and but they they added justin holiday that's fun and just a ton of undrafted guys and some second round picks and um julian strawweb strother julian strother yeah at the um 29th pick and i'm guessing they'll be able to replace ish smith's production totally fine that little elbow pull up who's gonna shoot it you know they don't have ish yeah. smith anymore no one's gonna go bar for bar with booker in the mid-range it's really tough mm -hmm. um i think like, like Okay, well, I have uh, Denver as the one seed in the West. In terms of, like, who's going to win the championship, I think that is a lot more difficult of a question. In terms of, like, you have the best player on the planet, if not top two, who is an Iron Man. You have, um, like, Jamal Murray uh, is kind of poised to have a career year next season. I feel like he spent last season – getting his legs back under him after the tough injury. And then also on a team with like five other double digit scorers, just didn't really need 25 a night out of Jamal Murray. He will have the opportunity to put that up next season, just because like the backup point guard role is not as good. And so like, they'll probably stagger a little bit more. He'll be able to run with that second unit and stuff like that. Um, and then he also makes a lot more money if he makes an all-star team. So I think he'll want to do that. Um, and Aaron Gordon also plays a ton of games. Michael Porter Jr. did last year. I know we were going to talk about the health here because it is uh, concerning. Like, you don't know if they've broken through or if they just got lucky, but Jokic has proven to be capable of elevating anybody on a roster, and this roster is better than Facundo Campazzo minutes. So I think the one seed is pretty solidly locked up for him. I have him... The Vegas line is 52 and a half. I have them pretty solidly over that. I'd go like 54 probably. 
I had him at 55, 55 wins. I felt pretty good about it. It's a great one seed. Um, my my biggest point was something you said in Jamal Murray last season was rehabbing, basically coming back from injury, getting his legs underneath him, and so like half that season was like Jamal Murray three for seventeen shooting. Like, is he even an NBA player anymore? <laughs> um, into like the cold hearted killer he was in the playoffs. I think this would be an all star season for him, possibly an all NBA season for him. He's a top thirty ish player in the entire league. Um. They're going to, it's like Shaq and Kobe reincarnate. Like they're going to fucking demolish people. So wild that Jamal has, like, I mean, it makes perfect sense that Jamal's never been an all star with the injuries and whatnot. But just like teams that don't have a second all star don't usually perform as well as Denver did. And guys that have usually never been an all star don't usually do what Jamal Murray did. And so it just <laughs> feels like this is, this is absolutely going to be a breakout season for him. I'm also interested to see if they might get even better in the regular season by staggering their starters. I know Malone did like a ton of, hey, this is the starting five and they're going to play their minutes together throughout the course of last year's regular season. I think that makes sense. You know, you got Porter trying to be healthy. You got Jamal trying to be healthy. You're trying to make it all click. You've clicked now. That is, we look at Golden State, we usually say they are the best starting five in basketball. I mean, Denver's starting five may, it may give them a run for the money. It's one of the two. Not with Chris Paul in there. That shit is not even close to me. I mean, maybe if they figure out how to like, uh, yeah, the last I could be year mean. De- or Golden <laughs> State. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair. Um, but like, I- I'd be really interested to see. Hey, are we gonna get a little bit more uh, of Zeke Naji with the other like mixed in, not just like, hey, this is the Jordan Naji, Peyton Watson, Christian Brown, or Christian Brown and Reggie Jackson lineups. Like, please don't ever make me have to watch that. They are really rough. Um, yeah, it's tricky because uh, pretty much all of the like bench wings. I know Najee's listed at a backup center. He can run the four really easily. Uh, mm-hmm. Same with Peyton Watson. Are smart and like they can play next to Jokic. Like they know how to move off the ball. They're long and switchable defensively, and they can cut and all that stuff. But when you ask them to do it on their own. It has not panned out for them offensively, and uh, it also seems to hit their confidence pretty hard. So I would Mm -hmm. like to see more rotations with stuff like that because I do think um, guys like that are where the internal improvement to make up for losing Jeff Green and Bruce Brown are going to come from. Uh, It's going to be guys like Christian Brown. It's going to be guys like Zeke Nagy. Chanchar's ACL fucking snapped in FIBA, I'm pretty sure. So he's out for the season. But he was good when he was here. And if he can make the playoffs, I mean, he probably won't play. But yeah, I think uh, those guys are... They're not like Denver's season doesn't hinge on them. It would fucking rock mm-hmm. if somebody could take a step forward in that department. If they could just be a competent rotation, you know, someone that every other team would be like, yeah, that guy was my seventh or eighth man that... Like, we'd be fine with that. I just had an aneurysm trying to figure out the difference between Zeke Naji, Naji Marshall, and James Naji. I got it all <laughs> sorted out, figured it out. Three different people. <laughs> I'm all good. You're doing Walker, okay? Like, all okay. over again. <laughs> I was like, James Naji. I was like, I thought he was like... Hey, like <laughs> uh, do you know there was another Jalen Williams drafted this year? Holy he did not man. go to OKC, but uh, yeah, we, we could have been in, in rough shape. Um, um, yeah, I, I mean, did, how are you guys feeling about like the Nuggets and stuff like that? I think they're still the best uh, in the West. I, I know we had on over the offseason and we did like championship odds. And I was a little bit too lazy and didn't go back and re-listen to that pod and figure out what our percentages were for everyone. But like we we had Denver, um, I think we had them at like twenty or twenty five percent, and everyone else was like five percent below. It was like fifteen percent was the next highest. Are you starting to feel a little bit shakier with the uh, the big moves on the top two in the East? Like they're gonna have have an easier playoff stretch to get there, and uh, some pretty pretty nice rosters. Um, I think. I think Milwaukee 
is a lot more realistic. I think uh, there's a way greater chance that Porzingis, his like durability last season was more of an outlier, and Boston is going to lean on him in a way that just like it doesn't work out when you ask a guy who's had that history to do that amount of stuff on the floor for the entire regular season and the entire postseason. Cause I mean, yeah, if Porzingis doesn't pan out, uh, it's going to be really hard for them with like just Horford there at this point. Whereas, I mean, you saw Giannis push teams to seven without Middleton in that Boston series two years ago. And I mean, albeit he like, played the second half of the Miami series and they still got swept or whatever, but he was hurt and I don't really hold that against him in the same regard. And so even if Middleton's not good uh, or like hurt or whatever, if you have Dame and you have Giannis, I think that goes toe to toe with anybody in the NBA and they're both pretty phenomenal postseason players as well. So if we went back and did that, I think Denver was at like, 35 percent and milwaukee was closer to 25 maybe or something like that 20 i would probably switch that so that uh milwaukee i think they're the favorite right now but a denver repeat like if they get the same health and shit just like doesn't break right for milwaukee which is completely realistic yeah they could win as well i think milwaukee phoenix boston or denver all like something goes right for somebody and wrong for everybody else could be champions I wanted to note about historically when teams went out Jokic in the playoffs, like when the Warriors got him, it was with just crazy three point shooting and like bringing him out, making him guard the three point line. Um, and what the Celtics and Milwaukee added is two of the best three point shooting players at their positions in terms of like reigning threes from like 37 feet from the basket. Um, Jokic will have a tough time getting stuck in Dame Giannis pick and rolls if he's even near that. Um, and having to guard Chris Stops on three point line is a little bit scarier. They they faced a lot of mid range heavy teams in the playoffs last year, and it's obviously a completely legitimate championship. And they fucking smoked the entire league, but um, <laughs> that that very specific weakness didn't really pop up. Yeah, but simultaneously, I do feel confident. Um... Like the Dame pick and rolls, I think that is going to be really fucking hard to guard. But simultaneously, Aaron Gordon has low-key been one of the better Giannis defenders that's like a playable offensive guy. There's obviously some players that like you can just throw at him for a couple minutes and aren't viable offensively, but are just like monsters physically that kind of fuck him up. Aaron Gordon's pretty good at guarding Giannis. And I think uh, if you have him and like KCP, going at it in a pick and roll. I feel confident uh, that Malone can scheme around Jokic being really like tough there. I think Porzingis is harder because it would just be like the straight up matchup and uh, he would just be on him the whole time. But I don't know. Jokic isn't like the most insane rim protector to begin with. So like losing him in that aspect defensively, it's not the end of the world. It would like make me more nervous though. Cause Tatum is a phenomenal slasher and things like that. If you don't even have a body down there, it's going to be hard. Go ahead, Nate. Oh, I, was, I was just thinking, uh, Jack, when you gave your list, you put uh, Phoenix in there and I just, I see Denver as such a Phoenix nightmare. Like, I, I don't know how they're going to defend Jokic. I mean, Nurk does I'll a dance fine on job. Phoenix's grave. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to crip well, on their grave <laughs> when that it's team like, okay. plays down. You have, um, you've got Booker, Durant, and Beal that I assume will be playing the majority of these minutes. So you could shift them down so they're the one through three uh, and play uh, Eubanks and Nurk to try to defend them. I don't think that's a great look. If you shift them up to try to have like a wing defender in there, um, you know, a Kogi or a Gordon try to chase around Jamal, that's fine. You're going to struggle defending Jokic. And now Durant has to guard Gordon. And I feel like Denver's going to be like, cool, let's start posting up Aaron Gordon and just like, you know, every fifth possession or something and have him back down Durant and see how Durant feels about that. And it just, I feel like it's such a matchup nightmare that. You know, Phoenix, hey, if they can get there without having to play Denver, something goes wrong in a different series, like maybe, but it's just, 
Mm-hmm. I, I think Denver has just it, it's a game of rock paper scissors, but Denver has both rock and paper, and uh, <laughs> uh, Phoenix has like analogy. a pretty dull pa- pair of scissors. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, I did just want to go on record. Yo- Yusuf Nurkic cannot guard Nikola Jokic. It's like legitimately yeah. one of the most barbecue chicken matchups in the fucking league. Like the fact that he's also <laughs> a big Eastern European guy. The the Nurkic Jokic matchup in the round one Blazers series, holy fuck. It was like 33, 12, and six <laughs> on 70% true shooting or something like that. And Dame was nuclear, so it kind of gets overshadowed. It was food. And that was a, like a team with <laughs> arguably a stronger front court. Uh, just in terms of like the guys you could throw out there at power forward and things like that. I think Eubanks, they're going to need to rely on pretty heavily just in terms of like bailing Nurkic out in foul minutes. And I think Denver does beat Phoenix. But at the same time, I am just leaving wiggle room for the fact that uh, Devin Booker was one of the best players in the entire playoffs last season. I think the reason Denver handled Phoenix really well last year was because you could just leave Okogi alone. And Kevin Durant also missed a lot of pull-up jumpers that I've seen him make at points in his career, which like if he's just past that point, that's a separate conversation. But you can't leave Beal in the corner like that. You can't leave Eric Gordon in the corner like that either, uh, even though he's like, I don't know if Eric Gordon's your fourth best player. It's tough still, but the team is a little bit different and there's the potential for them to just get overwhelming offensively in a way that, especially if uh, Denver doesn't shoot the three pointer as well, it's not like an automatic waltz through the series. So I hate to say it, but do you want to know what Jokic did? I mean, you probably already know what Jokic did against Phoenix. uh, Let let me, let me hear it. Last year in the regular season, he only played them in two games. So it's a very small sample size. Uh, he averaged 31, 16 and a half rebounds, 12 and a half or 12 assists on 68.5% true <laughs> shooting. So, yeah. So, uh, despite the fact that he averaged 33, 10, and 5 against, uh, against, uh, Nurkic in the playoffs. That is somehow an upgrade against what he did against DeAndre <laughs> Ayton. Yeah, I I remember one of those games was the Christmas game, uh, and Booker did not. It was like a garbage Nuggets game that they won on an insane Aaron Gordon dunk over Landry Shamit that they shouldn't have mm. even been in to begin with. But uh, yeah, DeAndre Ayton's food too. Like, uh, I think he's probably probably worse than Nurkic, but. It's trash versus garbage. Like, they are not very good. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's... Uh, I think Denver has has just way too much. It's like, I I don't find Phoenix to be anything more than a good regular season team. Like, they're, they're going to struggle having to defend basically every single team. There's just no good matchups for the big three. Yeah. And, I mean, Kevin Durant... Uh, his level of play still rocks. First of all, if he's your he's like 35, 36, he's your go-to wing defender. You're leaning on him for 25 points per game for like if he misses an extended stretch of time, Booker and Beal will need to play phenomenally for Phoenix to mm-hmm. stay afloat in the kind of Western conference that we're talking about, where three through ten is decided by so few games. And so, yeah, like I don't know. Phoenix being there, it's a very gut reaction type thing uh, that, I don't know, usually works out for me, I guess. It got me here, but uh, I could easily see them, like, flaming out or whatever. It's not outside the realm of possibility. Yeah. I actually kind of like them more if Beal doesn't play. Just, like, get a little bit more <laughs> offense-defense balance. It's just... My goodness. You know, okay, That's if Beal's on the court, you're going to attack Beal. Like, yeah. Okay. No, I'm the, glad. I, I feel like I'm a pioneer of Phoenix hating. I hated every move they made. <laughs> I hate that roster. Um, I have. I actually the, like the guys around them. Like it's not bad. <laughs> you're telling me you like the 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 role players Phoenix has. I mean, holy minimum, shit! Guys, you get on the minimum, <laughs> they're fine. No, uh, you're 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 over you're overthinking it. You're looking at it like a vacuum. Like, oh, Eric Gordon, for that, he's pretty good. And it's like, all right, he's your fourth best player. Let's go. Roll it out yeah. there. 
I think they have a good like four through ten on a roster. Like like if that was your like the latter half of your roster, yeah, that's like a solid ish like back half of your bench. But that's like the guys you're throwing out there and being like, build a lead for us, keep us afloat (laughs) while Katie catches Mm -hmm. his breath. That's really hard. Wait to see the plus minus numbers on on these guys where it's like kevin durant 35 points eight boards eight assists plus 15 in a two-point loss um <laughs> i had a phoenix as a 51 win two seed i know it's off topic of the division mm-hmm. but that's just like i have the grizzlies out of as a 45 win eight seed and if things don't go great for phoenix that's six games away from like holy shit we have to win a play-in game mm-hmm and at that point, you're talking about like you could be playing a playing game against Luca. That's fucking mm-hmm. terrifying. Yeah, like I have that. Game, yeah, shit just gets very crazy very fast in a way that like if you're Phoenix and you've committed yourself to this moment in time, you don't want it to go that way. It'll probably be like you know you're playing Zion or you're playing Luca or it's Kawhi Leonard. Like holy <laughs> shit, one game elimination against Kawhi Leonard. Like that's <laughs> tough, man. The only game so, that Kawhi is healthy for is the play-in, but yeah, he fucking <laughs> drops 45 or something. So we've now done the entire Western Conference and did it just like this. We either had guests or there's at least three people and we took the average wins from all of them. And we're ending with Denver 55, Phoenix 51, Golden State 49, Memphis 49, OKC 48, uh, rounding up to the nearest hold number yeah. or just rounding to the nearest hold. Uh, Lakers 47, Minnesota 46, Pelicans and Kings are tied for the eighth seed with 45, Dallas there's 43, and then the Clippers at the 11th seed, 42 wins. Just a a brutal Western Conference where one of those teams is not going to make the play-in, and three of them are not going to make the playoffs. Damn. Yeah. I mean, when you when you get to like teams have to lose and it's mm-hmm. going to be very difficult, like it's going to be one of those seasons that like a 15 year old uh, Jack would look back through on basketball reference and be like, holy fuck. Kawhi Leonard didn't even sniff the playoffs. Are we serious? He didn't even get to play for it. Something like that. And so, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I'm excited for the season. It rocks being a team that's kind of like locked into a playoff spot. I don't have to be as nervous. I feel like 49 wins for the Warriors is a lot. I don't know if that's like a super hot take. I know they're not in the division. It just jumped out to me when you were saying that. But yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, it might be a little bit high, but last year they were without Wiggins the whole, or I mean, pretty much the whole year. Mm. And so I'm like, mm-hmm. they were, you know, hey, there it's, uh, what were they, 44 wins without Wiggins. Can Wiggins Chris get you Paul. an extra five wins? I like Chris Paul. I had him 49 not, wins. Not punch, not having a teammate get punched in pre in the uh, you know, start of yeah. the, the preseason. I guess Steph I got like 56 games, right? Steph like barely played. Yeah. I also want to get this on the record on the podcast. I think Draymond Green's injury is bullshit. I think it's a cover story. Uh, I think him, <laughs> him being hurt right now is just a clever ploy. So that way they could be like, all right, we're going to start Chris Paul for a little bit. Draymond's going <laughs> to make a miraculous recovery so that way he can be ready for the start of the season. But we're going to bring him off the bench just because he's you know still recovering. And they're going to try it for like two weeks. And then if it's going well, they'll stick with it. And if not, they can they can put Draymond back in. It's just it's too clean for that to actually <laughs> be real. It's it's one hundred percent a fake story. Hell yeah! I am. Um, we're, we're schizo posting online. I, <laughs> I like it a lot. I love schizo talk. I had texted Nate after um we we did our Pacific Division preview, and then right after that, that news broke that Draymond was injured, and I I messaged him and said four to six weeks is the start of the season. He said more like three point five, but I think it's a cover for Draymond coming to the bench. And I said, okay, so we're just making shit up now. So we're just like, okay, like, no, that's just not true. Like, just reality can be whatever I want. My source is that I made it the fuck up. (laughs) Hell yeah. That's what's great about the internet age. You can make anything up. Nothing's real. Hell yeah. Just saying, it's it's too clean. It has to be. (laughs) But yes, uh, Jack, thank you so much for coming on. Plug your stuff. All right. Um, 
Hell yeah. Okay, well, follow me on TikTok at Jokic Joe Star. Also on Twitter. Uh, also on Instagram at Jokic Joe Star. On both of those, I have a podcast called The State of the League. This is the first ever plug I've done for that, so I've never fucking said that on a different podcast. But go check that out. I had Nate on to talk about the Raptors. I'm going to have Aaron on with uh, Jack the Kings fan here in a little bit to talk about the Sacramento Kings and what they're going to do this upcoming season. Uh, follow me on everything. Go listen to that. Keep listening to Hoops Temple and write to the Golden State Warriors and say you're cowards for not playing Draymond Green. We know he's healthy. Call them, write them, <laughs> email them. Aaron, where can people find you? Possible shares on TikTok, this podcast all the time, and the State of the Lead podcast fairly soon. Woo, woo, woo. Find me here. Find me on TikTok, Nate underscore Hoops Temple. Uh, email us, hoopstemple at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening.